Hello, I'm Ian, Tara's co-conspirator for the event. And when I'm not doing that, I am an accessibility specialist with a background in design and UX before that. I'm gonna kick things off the same way I always do with a um, little look back at some recent news. Some of the nice things that have been happening in the game accessibility world since our last event back in April. It's been a busy six months or so, so I'm just going to give you a bit of a highlights reel covering these areas. Hardware, information both for gamers and for developers, events, progress in the games themselves, people, and lastly, awards. So first up, advances in hardware. We've had more progress at platform level. So Xbox and PlayStation building upon the great work they did with the launch of their new platforms. Now going further with efforts to add things like Xbox's chat transcription, quick settings menu and visual filters, and the PlayStation 5's Zoom functionality. And new hardware devices too, like the Praetorian Game On 1, which is a system that allows, amongst other things, eye gaze on Xbox. The Arm Cycle Controller. This is a tiltable cycle interface with cycling mapped to regular controls. This is designed as a way for people with spinal cord injuries to be able to exercise through mainstream gaming. And the accessible cockpit. This is a super accessible Microsoft flight simulator setup in Israel that is seeing great application for occupational therapy. And there's a good lesson in here too. All of these fancy bits of kit I've been talking about just map to regular controls. So for game developers, rather than designing for the hardware, it's about us designing for the people who use it. Designing for the full breadth of human capability, as opposed to just supporting some bits of tech. And last is a favorite of mine, the Surface Adaptive Kit. This is a set of tactile bump labels, keycaps and port labels, together with some other add-ons to make manipulating laptop lids and stands easier. This builds upon the great work on and learnings from both the Xbox Series X and the Xbox Adaptive Controller, including its packaging. And it will make a tremendous difference to the experience of many gamers. So why am I such a fan? Um, first, because it's such a beautifully simple, elegant idea, but also it costs 15 pounds. So I don't know what the USA price will be for it yet, but 15 pounds is around $20. That is the kind of assistive technology pricing that I like to see. Information. Firstly, information for developers. We've had EA open up their own internal information publicly through their patent commitment. So this means that they are sharing their patented accessibility solutions with the wider community free of charge for free usage. We've had training and guidelines being made for creation tools like Roblox and Unreal. We've had PlayStation sharing their internal inclusive language guide. 
We've had the IGDA Accessibility SIG uh, launching their new Accessibility Top 10 guidelines. And we've had South Korea launching a government initiative to produce their own state-backed guidelines. And we've had a lovely little video series of 60 second accessibility tips from many cats. We've had this, which is dev kit produced by Special Effects. This is a really lovely set of guidelines on motor accessibility which has been informed by the team's many years of experience working directly with disabled players. The guidance is spread across seven topics covering both interaction and gameplay, with each guideline accompanied by a series of detailed video tutorials. And in the past six months, there have been multiple developer resources coming out of Xbox. This includes the Gaming and Disability Experience Guide, which is a complementary supplement to their accessibility guidelines, reorganising them by disability type. And a reference called Understanding Function to Design for Disabilities, which is what this screenshot is of. This is a really fantastic document that outlines how the various types of impairment work and how they relate to the demands that technology presents. And finally from Xbox, and this is a big one, the announce of the Gaming Accessibility Fundamentals Learning Path. This is an accessibility training program providing a thorough introduction to accessibility through a set of several modules. These cover a bunch of things, including basic understanding of mechanics and barriers, the importance of directly involving the community and the practicalities of how to go about that. It covers an overview of hardware and software assisted technologies, it covers the advice within the Xbox Accessibility Guidelines. And lastly, it has a module for gaming hardware developers and designers who are looking to create more accessible devices. And this covers both uh, bespoke approaches like the Xbox Adaptive Controller, and also just how to make general purpose devices more accessible by default. The course launches later this month it will be available to everyone and it will be completely free. And of course, a vital source of information for developers is players. Efforts here have grown too with companies like Xbox, Rare and Raven, both adding to and expanding feedback systems for players to raise issues through. And the flip side of that is, of course, information for gamers. And we've seen some really great steps here too. Xbox and PlayStation have both established permanent accessibility showcases in their respective stores. We've also seen the addition of accessibility search and filters on the family video game database website. And Dagas just launched the Accessible Games database. This is a similar kind of initiative. It's aimed at enabling informed purchase decisions through cataloging accessibility functionality across a wide range of games, and then letting gamers browse them through filterable lists like what you can see on the screen here. And last, but by no means least, Xbox launched a range of filterable accessibility tags directly within the Xbox store. This is really fantastic, and not just for players, for developers too. 
because it means extra discoverability, new ways for your product to stand out and be found amongst a, a crowded marketplace. This is something that people have been calling out for for years and years and years. So it's really great to see progress being made on this. And one last point on information. We've had a whole bunch of new data. So I'm going to bombard you with a whole bunch of numbers now. 66% of gamers are more likely to play games that are more socially responsible. 30% of gamers in the USA and 20% of gamers in the UK identify as disabled. 7.6 million of Germany's gamers are disabled, 10% of whom use assistive devices. The number of gamers aged 55 to 64 has grown by 32% in three years. Are developers incorporating accessibility into their games? 31% say yes, 42% say no, 27% don't know. That's actually an improvement on where things were the previous year but it is clear that we still have a very long way to go. Naughty Dog shared that 9.5 million Uncharted 4 players played with an accessibility option enabled. Ubisoft shared data on audio description. Year one of their audio description effort resulted in 56 trailers being described for blind viewers. And we've had data on representation of disabled characters as well. So from a really significant data set of 27,000 characters across 10,000 minutes of stream gameplay, the number of characters that were shown with a physical disability was 0.1%. not 0.1%. And of those 27,000, the number that they found with cognitive or communication disabilities was zero. So keep that in mind for when you watch the panel on representation tomorrow. So I know that was a pretty big and vast barrage of loads of numbers, but again, at the end, I will give you a link to all of those figures um, together with links to the actual studies that they're from as well. We've had lots happening in the event space too. General industry events being made more accessible. So this is events like the Summer Games Fest, the Age of Empires preview event, the Xbox and Bethesda showcase and Ubisoft Forward, all adding things like sign language and audio description. What you're looking at here is a trailer from the Bethesda event being shown with captions and with ASL interpreting. The interpreter here on the right is actually the always awesome Brad Galloway um, from GameCritics.com. And a quick bit of trivia for you, he is an early pioneer in accessibility. GameCritics actually started routinely including accessibility information in their reviews 20 years ago, all the way back in 2001. We've had development events like the Games for Change Student Accessibility Challenge, like the Sumo Digital One Button Game Jam for Special Effect, and the Boundless Game Jam. And tournaments for disabled gamers, like the Neat Mario Tournament, like the FIFA Xbox Invitational, 
like the Special Olympics Gaming for Inclusion Tournament and the Adaptive Esports Tournament from Logitech and Able Gamers. And other types of events too, like Everyone Games, which was a new online conference and streamer event focusing on blind and low vision accessibility across both tabletop and digital games. PC Gamer held an accessibility week. This was a whole week dedicated to accessibility journalism from across the industry. And a personal favourite, which was held by Xbox for Global Accessibility Awareness Day back in May. They held a dedicated storefront promotion showcasing games that had accessibility wins at awards. So specifically, these were games that, that won at the Can I Play That Awards, the Dakers Awards and the Game Awards. Which takes me neatly on to the games themselves. Now, normally when I give a news update kind of talk, I reel off a long list of games that have been doing cool things. And that just isn't possible anymore. Now the list is just too long. So I'm just gonna name a few particular favorites for you to check out. And if you do want a larger list, then again, there'll be a link to that at the end of the talk. So at the moment, we are still in the immediate aftermath of The Last of Us 2. And because of the development times um, involved in making games, it will take another year or two for the impact of that game on other studios to be fully felt in games hitting release. But the momentum that has been building in AAAs over the past couple of years has continued to build. In particular, with games like Ratchet and Clank and Far Cry 6, in some ways surpassing things that Last of Us 2 achieved. And you'll hear a bit more about both of those games over the next two days. There are lots of other AAAs who have been doing good things too, from Biomutant to Returnal, from FIFA to Psychonauts 2, from New World to Life is Strange True Colours. So it really is at the point now where you simply cannot release a AAA game without having a solid accessibility foundation. You can't afford to be that far behind what all of your contemporaries and competitors are now doing. Player expectations have now shifted too far. And with the kind of things that are currently in development, that is only going to increase. And indies have been knocking it out of the park in greater numbers than ever before, in no small part thanks to the continued influence of Celeste and its progeny. So just a few that I'd recommend checking out are Chicory, Horror Tales The Wine, Sunblaze, Twilight Drive, The Big Con, Severed Steel, Skatebird, Rainbow Billy, Unsighted and The Veil. Again, there'll be a link at the end with not just these, but many others too. And if you want to up your accessibility game, I can't recommend highly enough that you check out the indie scene. They are really acing it, not just in volume, but in creative, innovative approaches too. And if you are an indie yourself, make the most of the advantages that you have. Your ability to react quickly to feedback and engage directly with the community. To have full control without the huge legacy tech dependencies, without swathes of politics and internal advocacy to wade through. You are in a really wonderful place to drive the industry forward. And it's much easier to do than you might think. There has been an uptick in the number of older games receiving accessibility patches too. 
So get games like World of Warcraft, like Sea of Thieves, State of Decay 2, Dead by Daylight, Among Us, Gears 5. And finally, finally, we are seeing progress on the really old games, like Zool Redimensioned and Diablo 2 Resurrected. Remakes and remasters have often been a black hole for accessibility, really just focusing on updating the aesthetics, which is a crying shame. Because there are two main goals of re-releasing an old game, right? Firstly, you want to broaden the demographic, attract new players into the franchise. Secondly, you want to make another sale to original players. These are players who are now much older, who might have very different capabilities to when they originally played. So you cannot do a good job of meeting either of those goals unless you are considering accessibility. And the fact that this is now starting to happen makes me very happy and so does the wording of this announcement about Diablo 2. Hell welcomes all. And none of this progress is happening by accident. It's all down to people and that includes the expansion of the industry's headcount of people in dedicated full-time accessibility roles. Recently, we've had our very own Tara moving over to Xbox Studios as their accessibility lead. Caitlin Jones, James Berg and Elizabeth White, as I'm sure many of you know, have been doing great things for a long time at Microsoft and EA and Bethesda respectively, but they have now all moved into permanent, dedicated game accessibility roles. James and Elizabeth are in accessibility user research and Caitlin as a program manager. And we've also had Joe Baker joining Xbox again as an accessibility program manager. Not shown here is Billy Gregory because he is not working directly on games, but I'm gonna give him a shout out anyway. He is an absolute star of the web accessibility world who recently joined Ubisoft to head up accessibility across their many websites and apps. And this talk of people brings me on to the last area, which is awards. The kind of progress that I've been covering in this talk is being recognized that explosion of new accessibility awards that we saw over the end of 2020 and into the start of 2021 has continued. We've seen accessibility categories added to a whole bunch of other accessibility award ceremonies. We've seen it added to the New Zealand Game Awards with a new category, which was won by a game called Trigger Witch at the Game Audio Network Guild Awards, won by The Last of Us 2. And at a new award ceremony called the IRL Awards, that was won by three people, by Stacey Rebecca, by Doug Pennant, and also Special Effect. And there are two others in particular that have really stood out for me. Firstly, the Australian Game Developer Awards. So for this year, they added a category for accessibility innovation, which was won by a really lovely game called Unpacking. But they also have accessibility as a criteria on all of their other categories. So for example, if you want an award for your visuals, the judging takes into account how those visuals are for people with things like colour blindness and low vision as well. And secondly, the IGDA awards. 
This was a new award ceremony established this year. It's voted for by developers across the whole of the UIGDA membership. And what makes this award unique is that the awards list individual team members who contributed. So the Accessibility Award was won by Assassin's Creed Valhalla. And what you're looking at here is individuals who helped that happen. Which is great to see in itself, but it is also a great illustration of how much of a team effort accessibility is across all disciplines. But the progress that we're making isn't just about team efforts within studios. It's about the team effort across the industry, pushing each other forwards, learning from each other, sharing, collaborating. And that's what these couple of days are all about, both in the talks themselves and in the conversations and the connections happening on Discord. And that's the thought I'd like to leave you on. So there is just one last thing from me, which is that link that I promised with those longer lists in. And that is at tinyurl.com slash GA News dash OCT 2021. And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of the event and I will see you on Discord.